everyone, my name is Alita Williams and I'm the president of the Rotary Club of Chicago. I would like to convene our 5,692nd meeting of our club. And our thought of today will come from Ted Noble. Good afternoon again, Rotarians. Is that register and the Alita meter? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and to make sure. <laughs> Welcome. Well, we, we all celebrated President's Day yesterday, and um, I was actually resting up a little bit for the party Friday, you know, because it's going to be great. It, um, I think most of our presidents had a, a fairly healthy sense of humor. Uh, they'd have to, given the crazy things this nation and the people have done. But uh, I found a good quote from JFK in remarks at a dinner honoring numerous Nobel Prize winners, he said, quote, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent of human knowledge that has ever been gathered together at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. So, <laughs> uh, our, US, our US presidents are elected to serve us, and Rotary provides a great avenue for the rest of us to serve all of humankind. Indeed, if you are asked what Rotary means, I think most of you would say in a single word, service. If asked to expand, we might say service above self. But looking up service on the internet, I found 11 different definitions as a noun. The one I like best is contribution to the welfare of others. I think our four-way test establishes that quite well. We have so many ways to serve in our club, but if you're not a, a director, a trustee of the foundation, or a member of any committee, how are you helping? How are you serving? I had a law in my own Rotary career about 10 years ago when I was merely attending meetings. And I have to thank Mike Ferris. I don't know if Mike's here today, but I have to thank Mike for getting me involved. He called me one day and he said, with you being a lawyer and working in the financial field, the Rotary Foundation could really utilize your talents. So I accepted the invitation and having served now as treasurer, secretary, and now a, a non-officer trustee of the foundation. I look back and realize how much more I've gotten out of this than I put in. So I'd ask all of you to please get involved in serving our club, its members, and the community at large. If you are involved, reach out to someone who isn't, especially our newer members. So think about it, and don't forget number five of the four-way test. Have fun. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Ted. And now with that, we have a wonderful speaker today, Fernando Jones. Please honor everyone's time in keeping your questions succinct and one per person. I know we have a real problem with the one per person part, but let's try. <laughs> we, <laughs> we will take questions at the end of the remarks. All our Zoom participants, please put your questions into the chat so that we can get those answered. And with that, if Sarah would like to come up and introduce Mr. Jones. Okay, well, I am excited to introduce our speaker for today. If one word could describe this creative named Fernando Jones, it would be rare. This multi-instrumentalist started off by playing the blues on the guitar when he was just four years old. Today, he's still going strong as a band leader. This world-class, internationally known American blues man, educator, and songwriter was born to loving Mississippi parents on the south side of Chicago. They were advocates for education and the arts. Jones is one of a few living African-American blues men to have a tribute album of his compositions done by a band on a different continent. Jonah's Blues Band of Rome, Italy is the group. Jones has performed his compositions at basement parties, University of Hawaii, the Smithsonian Institute, the Conservatory of Music in Pescara, Italy, and nightclubs in Havana, Cuba. In January 2020, the National Association of Music Merchants invited him to host a lecture on the impact of blues pedagogy. As a lecturer, Fernando Jones has established blues camps for youth on the continents of Asia, Europe, North America, and the Caribbean island of Cuba. 
And for those who don't know, the Community Service Committee has sponsored the Blues Kid each year for the past couple of years. And this year, if you have a chance, please go check out and hear these kids play their instruments and sing, because it's just absolutely amazing. So with that, I turn the microphone over to our speaker for today. All right, first of all, thank you all, Madam President and Ms. Sarah Buck, thank you. I'm Fernando Jones, I talk a lot, so I'm going to yield my time back to Mr. Eric and we're gonna watch the little video. We put together a little three minute overview of what's happening and we're here seeking support for our Blues Kid of the Year contest. And what the Blues Kid of the Year contest does, it gives us an opportunity to have access to students who have yet to come to Blues Camp and our Blues Camp is free. We're in our 15th year, and we're in our 35th year overall of our Blues Kids branded program. The camp will run this summer at Columbia College Chicago during the week of July 6th. Once again, the camp is free, and it is for student musicians ages 12 to 18. However, there are some 9, 10, and 11-year-old kids that get into the camp as well. I'm going to yield my time back to Mr. Eric, and I'm going to let the video play, and then I'll take questions. Okay, thank you. All right, okay, uh, more volume, Eric, if possible. Every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. Michelangelo. Hi, I'm Fernando Jones. I'm a musician, educator, and preserver of the blues. As a result, I am a recipient of the Keeping the Blues Alive Award. I'm also the founder of Blues Kids of America, established over 30 years ago, and Blues Camp International, established in 2010, through my nonprofit 501c3 Blues Kids Foundation. My book, I Was There When the Blues Was Red Hot, has been used as a resource for doctoral students such as, but not limited to, Susan Ayler, Caleb Dubé, Amanda Huskinson, and Blues Kids around the world. I'm a band leader, a member of BMI as a writer and publisher, and a member of the American Federation of Musicians. I started off as a Chicago Public School substitute teacher. Currently, I'm on faculty as the founding Blues Ensemble Director at Columbia College Chicago, one of the nation's premier performing arts schools. What have you done with the block of stone that Michelangelo spoke of? Here's a little bit of what we've done with the block of stone and stones that we've had. Now I would like to close out with a quote from 
Desmond Tutu. You're not human on your own. You're human through relationships. We'd like to have a relationship with you. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, any questions? Can I have the microphone here for Sarah's okay. hand? I'm curious, as a fellow educator, yes, since you've been doing this for so many years, mm -hmm. have you noticed a change for better or for worse in the work ethic in the kids that come to your camps? That I'm glad that you asked that question. Yes, I, we get a chance to see a, a really improvement in work ethic when it comes to student musicians that come to the camp who might be the little brother or the little sister of one of the older brothers and sisters that come to camp, and especially kids who come to Blues Camp that are under 12 years old. We publicly promote 12 to 18 since it's free, so it's not a babysitting service, and student musicians audition to get into the program. So those that might be younger kind of feel like I shouldn't be here. So they work hard, 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 and by the end of the week, they're kind of like the most improved. Did I answer that question? Did I ask the question? I don't know. Did I? Well, I think from a social emotional learning standpoint, I think that some have which kids generally come back to blues camp for three years and then they kind of like age out or they work and things like that. And so I think that we've seen. I guess as long as kids feel that they are seen and people are listening to them, especially through the music and through the arts, I think that they have, we've seen growth and seen improvement. I don't still know if I answered the question or not, but yeah, okay. I have a slightly selfish question, okay. that's okay. Um, so I grew up playing the classical violin, I still mm -hmm. dabble here and there, mm -hmm. and something that I have found, and anecdotally, is that transitioning from classical music to blues can be mm -hmm. somewhat difficult. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any general tips on how to transition and then to make this question more universal um how do you apply i promise this one question how do you apply that same like transitioning classical to music to like real life how how is that transferable well i think one of the cool things about what we do and what blues is that the transaction from transition from classical music to jazz blues is pretty much an oral tradition type form of music and so what we do we specialize in the art of playing by ear so that poses a challenge for some people who are used to being married to the page, which is great, but it gives them an opportunity to be to be free and to kind of be reintroduced to themselves and reintroduced to that initial love of why they picked up that instrument in the first place. Yes, I didn't answer the second part of that. What's that second part? I got it. I, I'm. Oh, well, music, applying music to real life, first of all, we look at music in general as being a second language. And as a second language, it offers you an opportunity to teach other people that language or embrace other people who also speak that language, no matter what genre of music it is. Uh, the discipline aspect that you have to have with music practice, that's something that you can apply to life. Of course, paying attention, growing, learning, being a lifelong learner, you're always learning new music. And there's always Lefty Diz used to say, he's always trying to find that missing chord, you know. And maybe there is one, maybe there's not, but as long as you think that there is, there's something to always pursue. Yeah. How many students do you have on an average in your camp? And of those students, how many are girls? Oh, it's about 60, 40 boys to girls. And at the Chicago camp, we have a minimum of 75 students in the summer and a max of 130 kids. When we do blues camps in different parts of the world, the number goes from like about 25 to 40 kids per camp. And this summer, we, we have a couple of camps that we will be introducing. We'll have one at the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City. Of course, we have Columbia College, that'll be the 15th year there. We have one at an HBCU, a historically black college slash university at uh, Winston-Salem State University. And we will also have an inaugural camp in the south suburbs at Governor State University this summer. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Shawnee's Teamer. I actually have more of a comment to share. I was very excited to um, see that uh, Mr. Jones was going to be speaking today, um, having had the opportunity to work with him in the past. So as I was um, Director of Revenue and Development at WYCC Channel 20, I was a grant writer and had the opportunity to write a grant um, that allowed us to produce a one-hour documentary um, called Blue's Kids Camp. Um, roughly, I want to say 2016. Um, I'm sorry, no, it was 2014 um, when we produced that documentary, but I was excited um, to see who was coming today. And just so you know, that program was nominated for an Emmy. Um, if you'd like to look it up, once again, it's called Blues Kids Camp, produced by WYCC. And it was a wonderful um, documentary. It allowed us to follow his camp for one week, all of the students um, as they performed. And then at um, we did a culmination of their final performance in the documentary on the last day. So it's a wonderful show. I'm sure you could probably find it online, but it's called Blues Kids Camp. Congratulations once again. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for coming and speaking and sharing with us. I'm excited. Uh, my wife and I will be there Friday to have uh, right to see you for the uh, there, which I would encourage everyone else to, to join us for the birthday party. <laughs> okay. um, outside of Friday, what venues can we see you potentially perform around in the city of Chicago? And to kind of tag off of that, what are your favorite venues? Because I know it's unfortunately some gone away. Some yeah. of them are still going, though, thankfully. So where's the best place to see blues or we can see you? In well, I play about every four to six weeks at a place called Naughty Lux and Naughty Lux Arts Foundation in Markham, 3442 West 159th Street. My I've been playing since I was four years old, so I've hit a lot of the venues, played a lot of the venues, but I really still enjoy playing house parties, believe it or not, and I've had an opportunity to play festivals. And I just got a call yesterday to play a house party March 16th for an old timer in a house. And he said, we don't have that much space, but that's, and I told her, I said, it's kind of like when we were little and you remember you watched the Christmas specials and you see Andy Williams, remember? Andy Williams Christmas thing with the Osmonds would come on before they got big and you see all these people playing around the fireplace. So I think that's my favorite place to play, you know, but I'll contradict myself. I also like playing festivals because I enjoy selling merchandise and signing autographs and <laughs> meeting people after the show. So, but Friday, they, you guys can catch me Friday. So I'll be playing. Yeah, you can have one more than one joy, but house parties are really really cool because you know there's no net you know you're right there and if people don't like you they can you know knock you in the head and if they love you it's, you know it's the intimacy is wonderful so how did you get involved with blues at four and what kept you there oh how'd i get well i got involved with the blues at four my older brothers played and if there's anybody in here that's a little brother or a little sister when your big brother or your big sister tells you don't do something, you know, hey man, don't touch that guitar, okay? And that's how I did it. And I was in love with my brothers. I didn't, I didn't realize that until that, that that's what it was because my brothers were cool. The next brother to me is eight years older than me. So if I was four, he was 12. So I had an opportunity to live as a four-year-old in a 12-year-old's world. And of course, when you're the little brother and you're trying to be like the big brother and the big brothers, as long as you don't tell when they smoke and do different things like that in the <laughs> 1960s and 70s, you're cool enough to hang around and you learn how to be invisible. And then I just fell in love with sound and I fell in love with not knowing how to play and thinking that I could play. And then I have nieces and nephews that are younger than me. So I had a little band with them and none of us know what we were doing, but I was the boss. So <laughs> that made it made it a good thing so and going through life the thing that has kept me playing relationships of meeting people being able to be silly and being scholastic at the same time and learning failing and learning failing and learning and and you know like when you play the blues it's it's almost like being in a secret society because when i came up of course hip-hop well, R&B and disco and hip hop was real popular. And so when people find, found out that I played the blues, it was like either they hated it or didn't like me, or it was like, oh man, you like the blues, you know, a secret society, secret handshake type kind of a thing. And they would embrace me. So that's that. 
one thing when I was in college, I used to produce blues festivals so that people on 43rd, like Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, my brother, Magic Slim and the Teardrops, Coco Taylor, all those folks, I brought them up to my school to play because my friends were bringing Shalimar and Roy Ayers up to school. And I was like, well, hey, let's bring some blues folks. Then graduated, wrote a book on the blues, blah, 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 created Blues Kids of America, 1988, 89, and I'm here today, so. Yeah, I, I was a, a, uh, had an opportunity to see Lonnie Brooks play at the Morning Valley Community College, and he, mm -hmm. he played. He had his son come out and play with him. Um, do you play with family members as well? Well, unfortunately, the last of my family members that played passed away last March. That was my nephew Chip Ratliff, who was a year younger than I, and he and Felton Cruz. Well, Felton is still with me, obviously. Uh, were my bass players. My brother Greg, we got a chance to play together. He passed away. The day when Jesse Smollett pulled the hoax, that was the day that my brother passed away. And my oldest brother, Foree Superstar, he passed away. I buried him November 1st of 1999. So, um, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, like, you know, you've traveling all around the world on um, uh, conducting these camps. How do you... Uh, educate as well as entertain uh, people to, uh, to students, prospective students who may not be as familiar with, uh, you know, the blues or making trying to make blues mm -hmm. a more contemporary thing, as you said, that you know, blues is a little bit more old school, I guess, you know, compared to the other, you know, pop, hip hop, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> R&B and other uh, really uh, other genres of music. Well, two things, and he's being inducted. Listen, to this guy's smart. Well, you know, one thing that's really cool about that, remember I talked about the secret society piece. So you still have, I was not the last little kid that liked the blues and was looked at as being a weirdo. So there's still some, and if, if everybody is weird in the same spot, then that means everybody is normal. So you still have that collection of kids. And you also have kids that are studying music uh, on YouTube, right? And you have people that go down the rabbit hole, they might be looking up a hip hop artist and click a button and it comes up and it takes them back to somewhere and they hear a sample of somebody it might be an Albert King sample and they listen back oh this guy played a guitar I've never seen a guitar before I've only seen turntables you know so you know did I ask your question okay all right so what made you start the blues camp and the the thing, that's that's another good question the thing that made me start blues camp I was a substitute teacher in 1988 started off I graduated college 1987 I brought my guitar to class one day and when you're a substitute teacher you get a lesson plan and it says from this time you do this 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 and then I think then class was over at 2 30. so by 1 30 I had knocked out all of the requirement for that day and I had my guitar and I just started playing and being a I guess what are you like 22 or 23 years old back then or whatever and then the other teachers in the in the school were like 40 so I looked like I was the kids age compared to what they were used to seeing so the kids liked me and I liked them and I just started playing and started singing and they fell in love with it. And then that connected me back with that four year old boy that I was so everything always takes me back to that four year old boy that wanted to be with his brothers and to be accepted so that's kind of like how that started. Fernando the at the oh, okay what's up Wes. <laughs> Uh, at the award ceremony last, I don't know what it was, last spring maybe, um, <clears throat> well, whenever, um, it, it was interesting to me, you have kids of all ages there, first of all, but also uh, I, had, I had left, and come out in the lobby because I think my phone was bugging me, and <laughs> um, one of the young men, the uh, a musician left and you you for whatever reason were also out there and you turned to him and said you know those little kids that are playing now they look up to you don't you think you should be in there while they're playing and i thought that was one of the one of the greatest things you could ever have said to him and, and he, okay he got it you know thank you yeah, you know, it's always important to 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 be aware that at different at different times of the day, you are a mentor and you are a mentee, you know, 
And I think that was the message that I was trying to get to. And I think that might have been Jaden Fargoso, who I was <laughs> knocking him in the head that day. Oh, okay. Well, it wasn't Jaden then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But you know, you've got to make kids feel responsible, just as we as adults are responsible. And they're wearing the brand. They're representing so many people that helped put those camps together. They were that kid in that moment was representing Rotary. He was representing, you know, Dunlap guitar strings. He was representing Columbia College. He was representing me. He was representing his family, so on and so forth. And once again, going back to that four-year-old little kid, whoever, whatever point I was making to that, those little kids were looking up to him. So he had a responsibility to be on point all the time. And the good thing about blues kids being the blues camp being free, we do it through our 501 C three is that we don't have to have kids that don't necessarily want to be there. So we can have afford to have the luxury to be like, this is how it is. And if you're not going to do it, you don't have to be here, you know, but we don't generally don't have a lot of uh, discipline problems. I think one of the, the biggest scariest things for kids, I think that happened at blues camp the first year, some of the kids went in the bathroom and they used too much uh, lotion when you push the thing and they were all scared and stuff, you know, so but but everything is generally cool. And I'm going to yield my time back to the president. And uh, like the comedians, I'll be here all week. All right, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Jones. Oh, I need you to come back up here for a second. Oh. <laughs> So we'd like to thank you for being here today. We have a wonderful oh, Rotary you. coffee thank cup for you. And you. you will receive a pack of Al's cookie mix. So this okay. year, I am supporting Al's cookie mix. Al okay. started a cookie company for his autistic son okay. and their friends so that they would be able to have jobs once they aged out of the CPS system. Yeah, so cool. yeah, cool. so thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay, and so, so now if I could get Shawnee Steamer and Richard Yang to come up to the front, and Andrew, we have some new members to induct today. Thank you, Lita. And I was actually just saying to Sarah, um, Al's cookie mix was uh, highlighted by NPR in like a two minute segment this morning, actually. So yeah, try and get in the gyrator so people can hear that. It was a very nice piece. All right. All right. Everybody ready? All right. It is my great pleasure on behalf of the board directors and members of the Rotary Club of Chicago to welcome you as a member of Rotary One. We welcome you not only for the fine fellowship that we shall share, but also for your talents, abilities, and enthusiasm that'll help us to carry out many projects to make our community, our country, and the world a better place in which to live. Rotary is not a political organization, but all Rotarians are vitally concerned with everything pertaining to the good citizenship and the election of good men and women to public office. Rotary is not a charitable organization, Yet its activities exemplify the charity and the sacrifices that one should expect from people who believe that they have a responsibility to help others. Rotary is not a religious organization, but it is built on those eternal principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to upholding the highest professional standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and international peace can be achieved when business people unite under the banner of service. I'm gonna have you all stand for the uh, delivery charge that's gonna follow here, so, which you already are, so. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Shawnees and Richard, you have been chosen for membership in the Rotary Club of Chicago because your fellow Rotarians believe you to be a leader in your profession and because you manifest the intelligence and commitment of heart that fits you to interpret and part the message of Rotary. You are a representative of your profession in this club and any information of an educational value pertaining to that profession must content come naturally from, uh, to us through you. At the same time, you become an ambassador for us to your profession 
and we rely on you to carry the principles and ideals of service which we here inspire to those who share your professional activity. The community will know and judge Rotary by your embodiment of it in character and service, and we accept you as a member because we know our principles and organization will be safe in your keeping. We also expect to give us the, you to give us the inspiration that will help us to become better Rotarians. And it is with this hope that I ask the President of Rotary Club of Chicago, Alita Williams, to invest you with the distinguishing pin of a Rotarian and gladly offer you the right hand of Rotary Fellowship. Thank you, Alita, and congratulations. <laughs> And with that, we will ask Shanice and Richard just to say a little something about themselves and introduce yourselves to the club. <clears throat> I wrote a little note, but I'll share a little bit about me. I'm currently um, currently uh, Associate Director of Annual Giving at Northeastern Illinois University. Um, being a part of Rotary definitely gives me the opportunity to expand the outreach and communication um, for the university and connect with others throughout the community to help support um, all of the hard work that I work with um, relative to the foundation and the university to help the students. Um, I also wanted to um, definitely say I'd like to thank you all for recognizing me um, on this day and welcoming to, to the Rotary One organization. Having had the opportunity to join Rotary as a guest speaker several times, um, it feels very wonderful to be here this time as a, joining as a Rotarian, so I'm excited about that. Um, and as you celebrate your 119th anniversary um, this week, I am proud to be able to be a part of the great history of Rotary and all that you do on the local, regional, and international level. And I look forward to um, being part of that service to help you expand the organization and everything that you've accomplished um, with Rotary One. Thank you. Whoops. <laughs> Well, first off, I'd like to say thank you to Andrew and Aleda for uh, inducting us, as well uh, as I uh, want to uh, thank you for the incredible luncheon. I know I've been here for several, uh, several occasions, haven't had the chance to uh, synchronize my schedule, to, and then finally it's good to uh, be inducted and truly honored for this opportunity. Um, I guess to start things off, I want to thank, um, start off, I want to thank Trisha, as well as uh, uh, Marco Hugo, as, and then the very beginning of Michael Tang from the uh, the Rotary International Finance Committee from District Number Thirty Five Twenty Three for recommending me and uh, uh, recommending me to uh, Rotary One itself. Though I, for me right now, I currently do uh, import exporting at, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, trading company and. Uh, where we import in like plant products so and then so it's given me an opportunity to travel around the world and at the same time for me uh, just to uh, growing up here the uh, my parents have instilled in me to encourage me to do uh, do humanitarian work and back to the community and I just uh, uh, being a part of uh, seeing part of Rory one just to see the amount of humanitarian work to do it with various amounts of different uh, organizations, uh, helping out with people, organizations with different visions though. It's uh, definitely really, uh, really impactful and really allows me to see people from different walks of life, uh, different visions and with uh, you know, different professions. So I'm really looking forward to this opportunity and uh, moving forward. Thank you. Oh. You guys can sit down. Welcome to our great new members. And so with that, I would like to introduce any visiting Rotarians we have in the room. She's gonna she's gonna go get you the microphone in just a second. But the people on Zoom can't hear you. That's the only Hi, uh, my name is Norma O'Day. I am a member of the Citywide Service Organization of Rotary, which is kind of based in South Loop. We are a little bit different format. We just have one meeting a month and do two to three volunteer um, projects a month. So it's a little bit of different setup. I work for PNC Bank. I'm a construction project manager. Oh, 
Welcome. Thank Good. you so much for joining us <laughs> Thank today. You. And we have some guest of Rotarians in the room today. <laughs> He's like, you mean me? Yeah. Two, two things. Never give me a mic, but you guys don't know me yet. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to behave. Uh, so I'm just glad to be here. Uh, I've heard a lot about rot Rotary over my life, but never really came to an event, so thank you. Uh, came here to just honor my good new friend and uh, glad to see her inducted. So it's been a pleasure. Nice meeting some of the people I've met today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so as we talk about volunteer opportunities, every Wednesday we have a volunteer opportunity at Cornerstone from 2 to 5 if you would like to prep in the kitchen and from 5 to 7.30 to actually serve the guests that come in and help us pack meals to go. We do approximately 150 to 180 meals every week, so we always need as many hands as possible. And as we said, Friday is our birthday. It's here, yay, uh, with food, fun, and Fernando. So Fernando Jones <laughs> will be there. <laughs> Yep, Sarah came up with it, it's our new tagline. Um, so Fernando Jones will be there with his band to entertain us for dancing. I will be doing the food so you get to taste out my wonderful wares, as I like to say, and we're gonna have a great time. So we would love to have as many people out to help us enjoy and celebrate the 119th birthday of the Rotary. And the, the Chicago Coalition is doing a packing day on Saturday from 1 to 345 at the Chicago Food Depository. If you are interested, please use that wonderful QR code. If you can't do the QR code, please let me know and I will, I will forward you the link so that you can sign up. At last I heard there were still 10 spots available for this Saturday if you want to come out and meet other Rotarians from all the Chicago clubs. And it's dictionary time. You want to come up with us? Or you just want me to ramble about it. It's all right. <laughs> She's bringing you to Mike. Mantra was just said, he just told me to give him hell. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> um, the dictionary project is a project that this club has participated in for many years. And one of the things that unfortunately the public schools won't let the kids do anymore is uh, you would get thank you notes from the children. And typically you deliver dictionary someplace and then a big envelope would turn up, sometimes just at the front desk downstairs uh, with all these notes from the children. And I like to recount one in particular, um, it was a, boy from the Haines School in Chinatown. And you have to understand that Chicago is still a city of immigrants. You have kids in those schools, or that school, and others also, whose English isn't wonderful. In fact, it may be pretty poor in some cases. And I have actually had teachers translate in some of the classrooms. In any event, this young man didn't need any translating. And he understood the situation very well. And the gist of the note was, I'm, thank you very much. I'm so happy to have a dictionary. My sister has three dictionaries, but she's mean. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have one of my own. And he goes on to thank, I don't know, to thank, thank us two or three more times. In any event, it's a wonderful opportunity to really get out and be in the classroom and understand a little more about those kids and what they need. The dictionaries are just one very small element of this, but it's something we can do. So if you're interested, get in touch with me. My email is in the directory and I will send you the necessary information. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Wes. And job one, applications are open for two more weeks. So if you know any student in Chicago, in any Chicago high school within the city of Chicago, juniors and seniors, they can now apply to be a part of our job one program 
For those of you all who may not know, our Job One program is our signature program in which we recruit Chicago high school juniors and seniors into our summer internship program. They go through three weekends of job readiness training, resume building, job interview skills, leadership skills, and things of that nature. And then they go to a job fair where we have recruited wonderful employers that want to employ them for the summer at whatever the Chicago going minimum wage is as of July 1st of 2024. Um, and it's such a great program and it's really a mentorship and educational program for our students to really know what it's like to work in an actual business environment. For many of them, it's their first real job. Um, to say, but we really do a lot to support them through that project and through the summer. And then as seniors, they can apply for up to a $2,500 scholarship to go to school. So Rotary Means Business, our Chicago Downtown Network Fellowship Program meets on the first Monday of each month, open to everyone. Rotarians and non, we just want to get together and get back to the original, to some of the original tenets of Rotary, which was great business people coming together, networking, building relationships, and doing great work, and also business together. And Sarah and the community service, do you want to talk about the opportunity grant? Okay, it's time again. Uh, we need people to help us get the word out about our uh, request for proposals for our Community Service Committee CPS Opportunity Grants. This can go out to any CPS teacher in any content area. <clears throat> they can apply for grants up to $3,000. So if you know of anyone, please direct them to the website. Um, that website has not only the application, but also a sample grant to help people um, submit the best possible grant that they can. Applications are due on April 9th, so please help us get the word out. I think this is what, the fourth, fifth, fifth, fifth time we've done this, so um, hopefully we'll get some good applications this year, but we need your help to get the information out. Thank you, Sarah. And what I like best about this grant is that we go to the teachers and say, what do you need? Instead of us just going to them and saying, hey, here's, well, well the dictionaries, they need dictionaries. But, you know, a, a lot of organizations just kind of tell people what they need. And this, great, this grant gives us the opportunity and gives those teachers the opportunity to say, hey, this is what we need for our students. And this would help benefit our school and this class the best. You know, and it was anywhere from bus passes to 3D printers, you know, because every school is different, every class is different, and that's, I think that's what's best about this. Yes. One of the things you can say is the responses are all over the place. You can't imagine the kinds of things, as you pointed out, that these teachers feel the need of. And it isn't just greed, it's really a, it's really a need. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and the reason we can do the great things that we do is for the Rotary Foundation and the Rotary One Foundation. Without the donations that we give to those foundations, we would not be able to do the wonderful work that we do. The money for all of our service projects and everything our service committee does comes from our Rotary One Foundation that we give to and we have managed and kept the corpus going so that we can continue to do good work in the community and internationally. And the Rotary Foundation gives us back a portion every three years from what we give so that we can do district grants and international grants that get met with the money that we have. So we double and sometimes triple our money. But without those donations, we don't get that back. So you know how it goes. You can't get back for something you didn't give into. And with that, we have wonderful, cute little piggy banks on the table great way to donate today everything that is put into the piggy bank will go toward fernando jones blues camp today so please give as you see fit as i like to say coins dollar checkbooks we take off <laughs> and this is the qr code for our weekly newsletter if you are not already a part we would love for you to get our weekly newsletter that tells you about all the things that we're doing and our wonderful member spotlights to learn more about other members. And our upcoming committee meetings. Job one is up and going, and we have our next committee meeting next Monday. The DEI committee 
everyone is looking for people to come out and be a part. So like Ted said, you don't get the most out of being here if you're not a part of a committee, a board. We're, we're always open to take help from our members and want them to be more involved. We have our Friday roundtable every Friday, which I think we may cancel this Friday because of the birthday party. Um, on the 27th, we have Richard Siegler, Jetta Bates from Twist Global on March 5th. We're gonna have that offsite that's gonna be a part of our Carl Zimmerman Entrepreneurship Series. And she's gonna talk to us about entrepreneurship and how that can tie into service. And then Carol Sharp from the Knight Ministry, which we've done work with before. So we get to get a great update of what they're doing now in this great new climate of the influx of migrants. And today is our birthday day. So we would love to say happy birthday to Sarah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and all our other members who weren't able to make it today, but we're so super excited to be able to celebrate our members. Happy birthday, Sarah. Hope you have a great day. <laughs> well, happy birthday to Fernando too. Look at that. And with that, because I like to put people Yep, Shelby, come on up here. Shelby is going to lead us into the four-way test. That's what happens when you don't come to meetings all the time. I put you on the spot. <laughs> the accountability for me. Um, is it the truth? No. The four. <laughs> Everybody, please stand. I've never done this before. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Number one. Number one. Is it the truth? truth? Number two. Is it fair all Number three. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Number four. Will it be beneficial to number five? And number five. Will it be fun? <laughs> Thank you all so much. And with that, we adjourn the meeting. <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> all right.